Uh, we were just talking about our favorite course as a student um, and talking about these as some of the themes that that showed up in the comments here and that we often hear that my favorite course was the one where I felt like my work mattered. Um, Cheryl's example of learning how to actually do photography and work in the dark room itself. This isn't just some made up exercise I'm going through to get a grade. I'm actually learning something that's concretely useful. I saw myself in the materials. The, the instructor cared about my success and well-being. I heard that in several different comments. The professor was was energized and engaged and actually seemed to want to be there and want to talk to us. They weren't just sort of trying to run out the hour, that sort of thing. Um, several of you all also talked about this idea, right? The sci-fi class taught me how to write. I built a portfolio that helped me find other opportunities. I did something that mattered to me in different ways. And then the great stories were in there too, right? The, the field research on voodoo curses. What great stories. You can dine out on, on the voodoo curse story anywhere you go. So the, the proposition I want to suggest to you as we talk for the next 45 minutes or so is that as we talk about open pedagogy, what you should be thinking about is the course that you were you were sort of shared a minute ago that an open pedagogical course is often one that does the stuff that you found so exciting in that space um, and the other thing i want to suggest to you is this last bullet here i've never had a class like that before is something people say a lot but once they've had that experience they often jump to and why aren't a lot of my classes like that or why aren't all of my classes like that in some sense so i, I want to suggest that in addition to being really powerful in and of itself Open pedagogy is really important because it's an invitation and, and an open door to rethink everything we do in education, to say, this one class really seemed invested in my well-being. Why aren't my other professors <laughs> invested in my well-being? This one class was really useful to me and it felt meaningful. Why was this other class you know, different and didn't feel useful and meaningful in different ways? So open pedagogy as an invitation to do better, right? Um, that's a, that's a lot of what makes me excited about open pedagogy in particular. So let's talk a little bit about what we mean when we discuss open pedagogy. Um, and to be really um, sort of comedically simplistic about it, I'm going to break this into a discussion about open and then a discussion about pedagogy. And let's start with the open stuff, because open education is obvious, obviously what we've all been talking about over the past few years. Um, and I want to acknowledge at the outset that when we talk about open and open educational resources and similar, we often talk about that free plus permission framework, that open education and open pedagogy should be free and also come with a set of permission to do new things. And as we talk about open pedagogy, we shouldn't lose sight of the importance of the cost issues that we've been focused on for the past several months. Cost remains really, really central to all students' well-being. It remains really, really central to making sure that the most marginalized and disadvantaged students can compete on a more level playing field. Cost matters, of course. I want to suggest, though, that an open education program that stops at cost, that says the only thing open education is really good at is making cheaper textbooks, I want to suggest that that approach that stops at cost is not likely to be successful in the long term. It's going to run into some really significant issues. And I have this quote from David Wiley here that, that sort of underscores that, that, that a lot of administrators and funders are starting to ask the question, um, why should we support open education when we could just pay for everybody? these textbooks, right? We could just go to the publishers and pay for an all-in, inclusive access, automatic billing model. And if cost is the only argument you've got, the publishers have got that one solved. They can tell you a really good story about that. That OER needs to be more than just free textbooks if it's going to compete in the marketplace and if it's going to live up to, I think, the potential and the reason we all got excited about this in the first place. Robin DeRosa says this in a, in a pithier way, as she often does. I don't want to join a movement focused on replacing crappy, expensive textbooks with crappy, free textbooks. That openness, open education, has to think about cost, but has to be about more than just cost as well. And that's where the pedagogy stuff comes in. That's where the um, there's something that's happening here that's not just about inexpensive or free. And that's the part that's exciting to me. 
Open pedagogy is a big, wide open space. And if you talk to anybody who has done teaching in the past about open pedagogy, they'll start to say things like, oh, yeah, I do some of that already. Or, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with that stuff. I just never used that umbrella before. I never used that way of talking about it before. Um, and so there's a sense in which um, the open science folks like to say that open science is just science done well. <laughs> there's a sense in which open pedagogy is similarly pedagogy done well or pedagogy done better in some sense. So what I want to do as we talk about what the opportunities for open educational practices and open ped are is to offer some lenses for what we mean by done well or done better. What is what's different than the crappy free textbook? What what can open do that's different in several ways? And I'll start with the sort of obvious one, um, and this is this sort of tracks historically as well, that the first set of writings that use terms like open educational practices or open pedagogy often framed them in terms of the idea of open pedagogy is basically the stuff you can do uniquely with an open resource. So if OER are these 5R permissioned resources, open pedagogy is the stuff that you can do with remixing with revision, with redistribution, and so forth. Um, and that's an important lens into open pedagogy. Ask yourself, how is an open textbook different than a closed textbook? How is an open data set available to be used and shared and engaged with differently than a proprietary data set, right? So open as open enabled is sort of the, the baseline. At least that's an important piece of it. Um, and, and from that recognition grew a set of arguments that open pedagogy and open educational practices should help move us beyond what uh, some people have called the disposable assignment, right? Or sometimes we talk about the banking model of education, where I'm the expert, I'm the sage on the stage, I stand up and I say something and you, the student, hear it, and then you write it down on a piece of paper, and I write an A on your piece of paper, and then you throw that in the trash can, right? The, what they call the disposable assignments, an assignment that's just um, there sort of to do, to be exercised, to be ca intellectual calisthenics or something. Um, and so people who advocate for open pedagogy often say that we can do better than intellectual stairmasters or intellectual treadmills or something. That, that there is some value in actually exercising your body and your mind, but there's more there, or there should be more there, than just running on the hamster wheel. So what are those other things? What's, what can we do that's, that's possible with open resources in the 5R sense and that takes us beyond the disposable assignment um, in a lot of different ways? And the first is that people have often talked about the idea of a renewable assignment, an assignment that uh, builds on something that's come before and that contributes out to the wider world in some sense, that's productive, that says let's do work that actually has meaning to the people involved and that actually produces something that makes the world a little bit better as well. Um, so um, the Wikipedia editathons edit have been a really nice example of this, where people are invited to, instead of doing research and writing a paper about it, turning it into the professor, getting it back with a grade and throwing it in the trash, they go out and they do some research and they update Wikipedia. So that our public sources of shared information are improved, are made more lively and exciting with photographs, are made more inclusive by highlighting voices and perspectives that have been underrepresented and marginalized by doing work that makes the world a better place in that sense. Um, in my own field of scholarly communication, there's a project called the Scholarly Communication Notebook that invites students to do exactly that to, if they're in an, an LIS course, uh, they do some research and instead of producing a paper or taking a test, they create a new resource for teaching people about a particular area of scholarly communication. So accessibility case studies or um, equitable health information or bibliodiversity or whatever it is that gets you excited about the topic build something, learn something, and then share something in a space where other students and other practitioners and learners can benefit from that thing. So that's the sort of the productive pedagogy lens, that open pedagogy is about replacing disposable assignments with renewable assignments that make the world better by sharing the fruit of student labor. That's the first lens. There's a second lens that's sort of related to that that I'm calling constructivist pedagogy, which is about explicitly really um, engaging with 
students' lived experiences and the things they're passionate about, and then doing work that, that changes the world, not just by adding something to the commons, but by actually engaging with the, the lived experiences of students and the world in which they exist. So uh, taking a course where you're asked to do some research about uh, poli-sci or a recent issue um, and write a paper about it and turn that into preparing students to write op-eds in the New York Times is a nice example of this. Thank you, Cheryl, for dropping the, the links in there as well. I appreciate that. Um, so we're doing something that's not just making something, but constructing something that builds on the specific humanity of all the people in that space and that makes a difference in the part of the world that matters to them a lot, right? Um, I'm a student who wants to be a musician when I grow up, and so I'm going to find a way to have a course assignment that help that engages with that natural interest that I, already, that I already have and helps me build something that's going to make the world of music better in one way or another. That's sort of the constructivist lens on that thing, on that work. Um, a nice example here is the localization work that has been done in open education communities directly. So I love this great Ontario business textbook sprint as an example. Um, we're going to take an existing textbook that's very generic and we're going to make it more meaningful for a specific local community. Um, so the eCampus Ontario example in particular, what they do is they have taken US-centric textbooks. This is a textbook on um, business administration in the United States, and they talk about dollars, and they talk about Washington, D.C. as the locus of laws, and it's very US contextual, and they Canadaize it. They say, what if we took a resource that's pretty good, and we, we spent our time and labor making it better? but particularly better in our local context. So we who are trying to learn about business administration in Ontario will have a resource that really reflects our interests and our perspectives. And you could do the same thing in my state for a North Carolina perspective. You could do the same thing um, down the road at North Carolina Central, that's an HBCU, and say, we want to really center the experience of the students at an HBCU. You can localize and customize in a lot of different ways. And they're all really nice examples of taking the, the time and expertise and labor that we pour into courses and making them meaningful in the specific context of the students that are engaging. I'll suggest to you that most of that work that involves localizing and engaging with students lived experience um, is not going to come with an open license. So it's going to be useful to have some sort of guidance on the copyright stuff there. So I'll point to this code of best practice and fair use for OER as one resource for thinking through the legal issues. I'm a lawyer in my the rest of my job. And so I will talk about law forever if you don't stop me. So I'm going to step away from the legal stuff now. Um, and thank you, yes, Cheryl, for sharing that WikiEDU resource as well. So that's that's the second lens is the sort of you've got the productive and then the constructivist lens as well. A third really important lens for open pedagogy is to talk about open pedagogy as pedagogy that is explicitly tailored and flexible. Pedagogy that says one size fits all doesn't really make sense. And the expectations we might once have had about who a quote normal college student is if they were ever true, are probably not the case anymore. The, the, the numbers are pretty clear that your median college student now is not an 18 to 20 year old white male who's planning to go into the professions, who doesn't have any children or family obligations, blah, 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 all those sort of assumptions that people might have brought to the process of creating educational materials. And that pedagogies designed for that imagined audience are insufficient for the, the diverse and exciting set of people who are participating in education now. So open pedagogy is a lens for saying, let's build pedagogies and ways of doing and being that are tailored to the actual needs of the actual human beings doing this work, not just for the imagined, quote, normal median college student. Um, the pandemic has given us some really nice slash challenging opportunities for, for talking explicitly about how a, quote, normal semester just isn't normal anymore, right? For the past, you know, undergrads, who have had basically an entire undergraduate experience now where I go to the class three days a week and I sit in that room in that space is not the way we've been doing teaching and learning. So we need pedagogies that um, that recognize that fact. And I am not sure if I have lost my share screen or not. So I'm going to Oh, Tanya, you may have taken host from me. Can you uh, give me host back so I can share the screen again?
I am the host now. Thank you so much, Tanya. Share screen. Let's return to these slides. Sorry about that delay, everybody. Um, and thank you again, Cheryl, for adding the links in the chat. So long story short here, um, we have especially needed tailored, localized, flexible pedagogies in these moments of disruption around COVID-19. We have also seen open pedagogy as an opportunity to take a step beyond we need generally tailored pedagogy to we need an activist pedagogy that says it's not enough to say a lot of people are different. We also need to say some people's differences are specifically marginalized in a lot of systems of higher education. And so open pedagogy can be an, an opportunity to say, how do we move not just beyond one size fits all, but move to use our pedagogies as a way to make our work more inclusive and more invitational and to center student agency in different ways as well. Um, so I'll point just quickly here to Lambert's work in terms of a social justice framework for open education. Um, this is a theme we're going to hit again in a few minutes, uh, but for now I'll just say that I think that that lens and that piece of it is really, really critical and it's a lot of what has made open pedagogy so successful over the past few years is we can do better than one size fits all and we can specifically use that tool to make sure people who have been excluded or underrepresented are included and can really have a seat at the table that's as, you know, what it should be in all the different ways that it should be. Another lens I'll suggest to you, um, as we've talked about sort of the, the renewable assignments and the centering different voices stuff, is another piece to that is this sort of sense of authentic pedagogy, that open pedagogy is best when it is an invitation for both students and faculty to come into the educational space and bring their full selves in a way that's authentic. Um, when I talk to faculty about open pedagogy, I often ask them the question, why did you get into your field? Why did you choose to devote your adult life to history or sociology or chemistry or whatever it is? Um, what was the passion? What was the spark that brought you into that field? And don't you want to share that with your students? Don't you think your students are going to have a better experience if they hear why Carlos Goller decided that he was really interested in biochemistry? So, so the, the opportunity to move beyond the sort of professor in a box, one size fits all model is important for some of the reasons that we've been discussing, but it's also important because it's a way for faculty to bring their full selves into the classroom, which is often really exciting and inspiring for them. Um, and it's also an invitation for students to be able to do the same thing, to say, let's be two humans really talking about this cool, exciting idea that the faculty member has devoted their life to very often and that the student is spending a lot of their time and energy and resources to learn about. Let's do better than the one size fits all. The textbook says this is the rubric, so complete this rubric and you'll be okay, right? Um, I think that's important for inspiring genuine connections. I think that's important for moving beyond a lot of biases. I also frankly think that's important for the value proposition of higher education as a whole. I think if we keep offering professor in a box sort of experiences for students, right? We're going to use the inclusive access model, the all-in model, the textbook billing model. Um, students are just going to follow the textbook. They're going to use the built-in exam questions that are already there. Um, they're going to watch the pre-recorded lectures. Eventually, people are going to start to go like, why am I in college? Why, why, what am I doing in this space where I'm not actually talking to the other smart people that are here, where I'm not actually doing work that's meaningful in any sense? I'm just going through this sort of pre-planned thing passively What's the benefit to me? Why do I do that stuff? So I think open pedagogy is a really, really important piece of the value proposition of higher education as a whole. Um, and I think we've seen a, a, a particularly st strong recent example of that um, in the past couple of years in libraries and in other spaces as well, as we've started to have these really important discussions about a critical understanding of ed tech under capitalism. Um, as we are automating and relying on AI to do a lot more of our design work, as we're looking to services like Proctero to decide if students are cheating or not, as we're outsourcing a lot of the expertise and should be human connection of higher education to digital tools that have a very specific um, you know fiduciary duty to see returns to their shareholders 
we're locking ourselves into some systems that that can do real harm in this way. And uh, the folks at Library Futures have talked really powerfully about the problems of the package deals that libraries have often felt pressure to invest in when those package deals build their collections out with materials that an actual living librarian would never have chosen to include in their collections. Um, so open pedagogy is an opportunity to say, proctoring software, let's talk about that some. Inclusive access, let's get under the hood of that a little bit. Um, you know, I think that piece of it is really, really critical, whether it's about privacy, whether it's about the digital divide, whether it's about all the ways that our experiences uh, can be mediated by tools that may or may not be fit for purpose in different ways. So to sum up those different lenses that we've talked about so far, um, I really like uh, Dr. Rajiv Gianyani's framing that open pedagogy can quickly be called an access oriented commitment to learner driven education. So access is the open in terms of no cost piece of it. Um, the commitment speaks to the sense that we're all bringing our whole selves to the work and then learner driven education, working with students to decide you know, what the course should look like, giving students the opportunity to build assignments that actually reflect their own lived experiences and, and their needs and, and the things they're excited about, right? That's really the heart of open pedagogy. That's if, if the lenses I was talking about were like grabbing different pieces of the elephant in the dark, um, maybe this is a snapshot of the elephant as a whole. And Rajiv has made this really nice set of parallel five R's to the five R's of open educational resources that we often talk about respect, reciprocate, risk, reach, and resist. Um, I encourage you to look a little more at that article if you're interested in this topic because he does a nice job of talking through the, the vulnerability that we need to bring, the activism that we need to bring, the really exciting opportunities created by open pedagogy as a thing. What I want to do next is talk about some case studies, but before I do that, I've been talking for about a half hour now, uh, maybe 25 minutes, um, and I want to take a second to see if there are any questions or comments or, or reactions that you've had so far that you want to share. So feel free to unmute, to drop something into chat, um, or to, just to, to share any responses you have. I'll take a quick Zoom pause, and then we can jump into case studies if, if there aren't or once we've addressed those. Will, if you could give maybe a, a one to two sentence definition of open pedagogy, how would you how would you do that? Yeah, great question, Cheryl. So I so I, I shared Rajiv's definition because I think it's a pretty good one. Um, and we use the lenses because any single definition often misses stuff unless it's this like 50 word compound sentence. But I, I think it's the idea of education that um, let's see how to how to put this centers the humans involved to do work that is meaningful to the lived experiences of those people. That's, that's maybe a different way of saying what Rajiv has said, but a, but a sense that we're, we're bringing our whole selves into an enterprise and that the work we're doing is meaningful, not just sort of in and of itself, but in some extrinsic way, either because it's about building a portfolio out or because it's about doing work that feels meaningful to a person in their community, etc. How's that, Cheryl? What do you think? Or what would you add to that? Yeah, that's great. When I was doing um, research on this, I, I, I kept seeing that there was no common definition of open pedagogy. And I just wondered if that's evolved since I've done that research. That's a good question. I, I mean, so famously, the, the essay that everybody reads in the open pedagogy uh, notebook famously starts out by saying, it might seem reasonable to start with a definition of this thing. We're going to resist that for a minute. Um, and I think that part of that is because this is still an emergent discipline. Part of it is because there's a lot that fits under the umbrella and you don't want to um, push people out. I, I, without going too far afield, I think the open education community has been grappling with competing definitions or competing priorities maybe that have led to some some lost opportunities and even some bad blood and so i think there has been a sense that we don't want to we don't want to get too prescriptive about it for fear of of missing an opportunity or of saying well not you you don't have a place in this space uh so that's a long way of saying no cheryl i think your research is exactly right there are people who have tried to sort of put a 
put a ribbon around it in different ways, but I don't know in the same way that Hewlett can say like an open educational resource is blip, blip, blip. I don't know that that's out there for open pedagogy in the same way. Really good question. Thank you. Any others before we jump into some case studies? If not, let's jump in. So, so another way to sort of think about what open pedagogy is and how it works is to look at the specific work that some people are doing in this space. So I'm going to share three examples with you, and then I'm going to invite you to share your favorite examples as well. So as we're talking, be thinking in your own head a little bit, what have I done that I'm really proud of and I want to share with people? Or what have I, what have I seen out there in the world that gets me really excited or inspired? Um, so I'll, I'll again seed us with a couple of examples and then we can go from there. I'll also say that as we think about um, open pedagogy, there are a lot of really, really strong resources out there. I mentioned the open pedagogy notebook a moment ago. That's a that's a really nice space where Rajiv and Robin, two people that I've mentioned today, uh, write in some depth about their thinking in this area. And then it just gathers a bunch of different examples of case studies. Here's how we did it here. Here's how we did it here. Um, Rebus has a really nice guide to making op open textbooks with students. Um, there was a really good book published a year or two ago called Open Pedagogy Approaches that's mentioned here. Um, and then more recently, this Open Pedagogy Project Roadmap out of Penn State, I think is just outstanding. I think it's a really, really nice framework for thinking about and talking about and, and really doing these issues that, that you could almost sort of read something in the Open Pedagogy Notebook and then find another example in the Open Pedagogy Approaches and then put it into practice using the roadmap. There's a nice sort of life cycle there. And thank you, Cheryl, for sharing those in chat as well. So I, I'm going to share two or three with you here. I'm going to be excited to hear yours as well, but there are tens and tens and tens, if not hundreds and hundreds of these out there for you to see across all fields, across all disciplines, across all institution types and so forth. Um, but I'm going to start with a, with a friend of mine and a colleague I really admire a lot, uh, Heather Maselli at uh, Roger Williams. She teaches a course called Core 101, which is the, it's the gen ed science course at Roger Williams at her institution. It's required for all students. So you get a lot, a lot of non-majors in this course. So you see a lot of science anxiety. A lot of people who are go like, I don't really think of myself as a scientist. I don't really know how I fit into the world of science. I don't really feel like I have a place there. And now I have to get through this awful requirement. What am I gonna do? That's the challenge they gave to Heather. Um, and Heather responded in a really cool way with an open pedagogy project around this core 101. Um, as you can see, it's it's student design renewable websites. And what Heather does is she invites her students to pick a topic in sort of the current space of science. And you can see AI, climate change, DNA, and that sort of thing, and to develop websites about that resource. There's a link here if you want to know more about the project itself. Um, but it's been incredibly successful in a really, really tough space. Um, and I also wanted to say I'm, I'm highlighting this one in particular because when you start talking about open pedagogy, a lot of people in the humanities and in upper level courses very quickly see themselves in this work. Oh, of course, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing literature for graduate students and I love the opportunity to, to develop new literary resources. But a lot of people in the, in the sciences and especially the hard sciences often have a little more trouble seeing themselves in this work. And a lot, a lot of people in those intro level 101 classes say that sounds like an awesome boutique course for seven students, but I don't think I I can do this for 25, 50, 100, 200 students. How do I how do I tackle that one? And Heather has given us a really nice model here. So one of the most important things that Heather does is she has really nice scaffolding in this space. That open pedagogy is generally going to be more successful when there's a lot of good scaffolding to introduce students to work that they might never have done before um, and to help students understand why they're doing this new and different work, right? A question you often get if you're doing open ped is like, why am I doing this? I just want a grade. I'm getting ready for graduate school. I want to see an A and that's all I really care about. Why do I have to jump through all these weird new hoops? So Heather does a really nice job in this course of scaffolding the work of saying, here's what we're doing with some granular detail so it doesn't seem so confusing. Here are the things you need to know. These are the steps that you're going to take. Um, and this is why I think this is the best way to learn this material and to demonstrate your understanding of this material. So you can see I've got the survey here. It starts off by asking students to talk about their interests, to say, uh, as a human being, I'm super interested in space exploration. 
oh, actually, I'm really not at all interested in space exploration. Can we talk about um, high resolution graphics in video games? Or can we talk about, you know, X, Y, or Z, whatever it is. So, so starting with student interest, um, she has a, a set of surveys to help them decide what topic they want to address. Um, and she also has a ton of really good information on here's how to think about privacy when you're sharing your work publicly. Here's how to think about copyright and ownership and what a Creative Commons license is. And Heather does something really, really smart, which is that she brings a librarian in to help her think about that stuff. So you see the other sort of touchstone for OpenPED in my mind is that it's a it's a collaborative work that it, that one person by themselves doing OpenPED is pretty challenging. Several people working together can be really, really exciting, I think. Um, so Heather has this problem, addresses it through core um, and has really nice scaffolding for it in a lot of different ways. Um, and you can see the sites now. These are from 2020 because um, these are just the last ones I pulled. Uh, but but the sites are, are beautiful. They're they're well done. Um, she's also been really intentional about making the assignments renewable in the sense that not only are they public, but one option students have is if I come in in 2022 and I'm really interested in AI, an option for me is I can take the existing site and improve it and update it and change it. And that might be going into the literature and saying, oh, actually, there have been five new studies that really need to be incorporated here. Or that might be saying, this the, the search engine optimization is terrible on this site. I want to help in that way. And I want to bring new graphics into it. There are a lot of different ways to contribute um, and demonstrate your understanding of what this thing is and how to communicate this thing. Um, but the the renewableness is the both the publicness, the interest drivenness, and also the opportunity to semester over semester build on the work that's come before. So that's Heather's project. It's a really, really good one, I think. And I think Heather thinks um, the students also think this and the data also bears this out. Um, Heather has done some assessment of her open pedagogy work. Um, and I am sharing some of it here. She presented at open ed last fall um, and talked some about the the great changes that she's seen from students in terms of their confidence, right, going back to the science anxiety I mentioned a moment ago, but also in their actual ability to to apply the concepts and solutions in their daily lives. So students come in not really sure why they have to be here, not really seeing a place for themselves and not really understanding why this is worth their time, except as a hoop they have to jump through um, and they're leaving understanding the substantive stuff in new and important ways, having demonstrated their understanding in a way that was exciting to them and feeling confident both about their understanding of the materials and about the value of the materials to their day to day lives. So what a really, really nice example of taking a, a major challenge. How do I deal with a bunch of students who don't really want to be here in the first place and making it exciting and meaningful for them. So that's one nice example from a colleague. My second example comes from closer at home. If you've ever heard me speak about open ed everywhere, you've heard me sing the praises of Maria Gallardo Williams because she's amazing and a rock star. Um, she was somebody who worked with folks at my institution very, very early in our alt textbook program uh, to develop chemistry materials. Maria also started out with a challenge. Um, when Maria started teaching, she was teaching uh, chemistry labs. It was a bunch of students who had to come in and, and do chemistry labs. And universally, what students said to her and her, and her evals were, we love you. Your passion is obvious. You're, you're concerned about our well-being, and that means a lot to us. We hate your textbook. We're trying to learn how to work in the lab and you're giving us a physically printed document that tries to explain how to do stuff. What a waste of our time. What a waste of our money. Surely there's a better way to do this work. And she said, I'd love to do better. How, what do you want? What would make it more useful? And the student said, we want videos. If we're going to try to learn how to run this piece of equipment, we want to actually see how to do it. She said, that sounds awesome. I don't know how to make videos. I'm not a, I'm not a movie maker or a cinematographer or even very technically, you know, um, knowledgeable in a lot of different ways. So what she did was she developed a new course that was grounded in working with students to create what she calls her smart videos. And this is student made, I'm going to lose the rest of it, but it's it's basically working with our students to create videos. So instead of just going into lab and learning how to use this particular device or that that particular device and then going about your day, the students learned how to use, demonstrated their knowledge through explaining to other people how to use, and also created a set of videos that are available to all students first on campus and then to a wider audience as well. The students worked the cameras, the students did the narration, 
they used social media to talk to their friends about what the videos should look like and they got back pretty clear like just show me how to do the stuff don't have any cheesy puns or bad music or whatever um and it was really transformative for her students in the first class and then for students going forward as well it's been really really exciting to focus on creating these videos in a new way the other thing that Maria has done is she has used that original class, right, students still come in and do a version of that work that's iterative, to develop another set of resources as well. Um, she's worked with her students. I have the dancing chemical reaction space here just because she's always doing cool stuff. Um, but she she took those videos which had been like go to YouTube and watch the video or come into the lab and scan the QR code on this particular machine and, and the video will pop up on your phone and she turned them into VR experiences. She turned them into a way to you know put on the VR headset and actually be in the lab and have the experience of moving through the space and turning on this machine and running this test and that sort of thing as well. Like Heather, she did some assessment and she found that the students using first the videos and then the VR had a better experience, not just, you know, a better experience than with the textbook, but students actually got better grades and reported more confidence doing chemistry lab stuff using this resource than they do with having a TA in the room and actually help them with the stuff. So really, really nice um, assessment outcome that came from that stuff. A really, really cool project here, her organic chemistry lab, virtual reality. And then a couple years back, all of a sudden, everybody at our institution and most in other institutions found themselves unable to physically come into the chemistry labs. And so what a godsend it was, what a, what a lifeline to be able to use this virtual reality version of chemistry labs when it wasn't physically safe to come into the physical spaces. And it's made Maria kind of a rock star. She has um, been, they've written a lot of really great stories about her in a lot of popular media. A ton, a ton of peers at other institutions reached out to her and said, hey, you're, you're the professor with those VR chemistry labs. We can't use our labs either. Can can we borrow your your stuff? And of course, she said yes. It's all openly licensed. Please use it however you want. Improve it. Add new videos. You know, continue to do that iterative stuff that makes open so exciting in the first place. Um, a really nice example of productive pedagogies that started sort of focusing on one problem and have become really really powerful at a global scale um, in response to the global pandemic that we are still, of course, wrestling with today. So those are two examples I wanted to spend a lot of time with. I'm quickly going to gesture to the fact that OpenPED also works really well when it's done across institutions. Um, so Melanie and Carlos here have been working with the Rios Institute on an open learning community. Um, this is one quick example of developing community where the, the outcome is not necessarily a first year undergraduate student completes their work at the end of the semester and we're done with everything, but it's actually about bringing open pedagogy to the way we do teaching and learning and training for our faculty members in different ways. So sort of doing open pedagogy for open pedagogy people, as it were. Um, this is another one I could spend a long, long time on if I if we had the time for it, but I want to zip through it pretty quickly right now because we have about 15 minutes left. Um, but I, I share it just to share that that open pedagogy fits really well in a standard semester long course, but there's no reason you can't do open pedagogy in a library's workshop in a professional education training in a conference presentation in any context that you wanted to. Um, so it's it's adaptable in that way in a lot of really cool ways. So before we start to talk a little bit about outreaching and engagement for a few minutes, I wanted to take another pause here and invite you all, if you'd like to share an example that you're really proud of or inspired by, I'd be excited to hear that as well. As I say, it can be something that you've been doing and you are, have been just waiting the whole time going, that's cool, but I want to tell you about mine. Uh, or it can just be something that you read about somewhere and you thought, oh, that's neat. I want to know more about that one. So who, who, if anybody, would feel comfortable sharing an example of open pedagogy that has been inspiring or exciting to you? Thank you, Cheryl. So the Press Books Directory has a collection of student-led OER with 24 books so far. That's a really nice example. Thank you for sharing that model.
Well, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Um, if you decide to share other stuff in chat, that's totally cool. Or maybe six months or a year from now, you'll be up here uh, in the next version of this session talking about the cool stuff that you've been leading. Uh, quickly, I wanted to share a couple ideas about how to get started with this work on your own campus because there are a lot of different ways into it. Um, and then I want to take a minute to talk about a new program that the Open Education Network is launching so you're familiar with that. And then I'm going to leave a few minutes for questions and discussion as well if I do my job right. So quickly, I want to suggest to you that Open Pedagogy can, can be a part of your program in almost any number of different ways. Um, I'm going to identify four or five more common pathways, more common ways to bring Open Pedagogy into the work that you're doing, um, but they are not the only ways for sure. The first sort of pathway for bringing Open Pedagogy into the work that that you're doing that I want to share um, is as a sort of natural uh, connection with work that's already happening in one way or the other. Um, so I've got on the left here the first professor that that at my institution we ever worked with on a wiki edu assignment came out of a coffee with a professor who was just frustrated. She was going, I've got this new class, it's on globalization and migration. I'm really bored with the old way of doing things. I just, I've, I've taught it the old way a bunch of times. I just, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm really bored by it. And so we had this really interesting discussion about, you know, you've got this course on globalization and migration. That's, um, this was in the late 2010s. And so people were thinking a lot about immigration issues in a lot of different ways. Um, so, so there were a lot of charged feelings. It was really important to give students space to engage in their own way. Um, and so open ped, as a, as a way of doing that work came out of that problem. It was turned into a great opportunity. I've taught some about Maria's work as well, the sort of, I wanna make my stuff better, but I don't know how to make videos. Well, I've got these videos, but what about VR? Well, I've got this VR, how does that work in a totally online instructional setting? The sort of either the next step or the big swing. You're talking to an individual faculty member or somebody in a department who needs a solution to a problem or needs to be re-inspired. That's one way in, is just through the opportunistic existing relationships that you have. The second way to engage with open pedagogy is a little bit more intentional and integrated, is to say, when I roll out my the newest version of my open education program, this is going to be an item on the menu. And this is something you see, I like BC Campus uh, presents it in a very visually appealing way, so I've got them. Um, but there are a lot of programs that say, come do open education with us. And here are five different ways you can do that. Uh, you can immediately just talk about open education with your students. That's that's quick and easy. You can write a textbook review and maybe we'll give you 200 bucks or something to write a review in the open textbook library. If you like what you find when you're writing your review, you can adopt a textbook for, you know, with this kind of support or you can adapt or create a new textbook with this kind of support. You can just add open pedagogy into that menu in a variety of different ways. And that can be anything from a, a complete course redesign grant that's focused on open pedagogy to, you you know, little sort of open interventions is the term that we use a lot in my work. Um, that that is the really the lowest barrier to entry. So so it can be opportunistic, it can be integrated. There's also I've seen a lot of folks have great success with doing some sort of open pedagogy event. Um, I'm sharing this one because I like this sort of structured public introduction. Um, from the OE Global folks, the Open Pedagogy Summer Adventure Launch Party. They did this summer adventure and it was kind of a summer camp thing where they invited instructors to spend the summer with them, um, watching videos, getting their hands dirty with the actual materials, having deep conversations about what they want out of education. Um, so in addition to the build it into the menu that already exists or the offer it as an option to a particular person in a moment of need, uh, making a big to do about it and saying like this is a cool new thing and we're going to throw up the big tent and they're going to be fireworks and and all sorts of good stuff. That's a third way to do it is to start with a big event. And then a fourth lens and one that's been really successful in my own institution is grounding this work in community is saying that open pedagogy works best when it's not just one person sort of wildcatting off on the on the edge on their own, but when people have a community of practice to work with. Um, so we launched this thing called the Open Pedagogy Incubator a couple years back, where we just invited a set of faculty from, I think we've had every department and school 
on our campus involved at this point, but it, it wasn't just humanists. It wasn't just scientists. Um, it wasn't just new faculty. It wasn't just senior emeriti. It was, it was everybody, you know, come in and have a conversation about teaching and learning and how openness can change that work. And it's been really, really exciting and really, really successful as a way to jumpstart a bunch of really, really different projects and also to bring people into a community, even if they didn't, you know, throw out their old textbook and replace it with hypothesis annotation and a wiki edu final assignment or something to find their own way to bring the values and practices and ways of engaging with people into that work in different ways. Um, question, do you work with your Center for Teaching and Learning? We have worked with them some. We also have a group on our campus called Delta, which is the sort of digital transformation of education. They have also been really, really good partners. And our bookstore has been a pretty good partner in some ways as well. Um, but no, a Center for Teaching and Learning, Faculty Excellence, those are natural and really, really powerful partners. Uh, I mentioned Maria a couple times. She's actually uh, taken a new position as our head of the Center on the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. So, so she's now a, a, an inside person in our Center for Faculty Excellence um, that's been a really good partner in this stuff as well. Um, and, then, and then a last sort of entryway that I wanted to suggest to you all with about uh, nine minutes left is that the Open Education Network has launched a new certificate in open educational practices that is about walking the walk and preparing you to do the work that we've talked about that I've been talking about for the last little bit here. Thank you, Cheryl, for sharing the link to that as well. Um, it's team based. I'm going to share a few details in the next slide here. It's a nine, nine week long course. Um, it's designed to take you from the foundations of OEP and accessibility concerns. Uh, there's a really strong strong social justice lens at the center of this work. Um, we're also talking about some universal design for learning. Um, and it's going to lead to a customized plan for implementing open educational practices on your own campus. Something that we're doing that this is kind of a big swing and we'll see how it works is we're inviting a cohort of uh, teams or pairs. So the idea is if you want to do OEP really well, one way to do it is to have a librarian and a faculty member working together, like with Heather when I talked about her project a moment ago. So we're doing our best to invite teams to come in and say, I'm the librarian and I'm the faculty member, and we're going to we're gonna make a plan together to make this successful and build a community of practice. Um, we've got a, a, a set of instructors that are really, really excited to do this work. Um, and it's free. We've got some funding from IMLS to make it happen. So there's no cost involved in participating in this program, um, which we hope will will help us walk the walk in terms of really being inclusive and letting people participate, even if their institution isn't super duper wealthy. Um, this is the set of folks who's come together to create it. And a lot of us are going to be teaching it as well. Um, other than that, Will Cross guy, I think these are all outstanding people. Um, no, it's, it's been really fun to work with with this group of people to, to sort of bring what each of us has to the table to make this successful successful. Uh, Cheryl shared the link and it's there as well. Tanya, I think you're on the call. Is there anything you want to add uh, to what I've said about Open PED or about the certificate program in particular? Thanks, Will. And I'm sorry that I interrupted earlier. My neighbor's uh, connectivity issues have become mine as well. Um, I, we are really excited to launch this program. Thank you, Will, for doing such an excellent job um, providing uh, such a deep overview of, of what Open PED is. I think the only little thing that I'll add is that if you're not um, able or interested or somehow, um, you know, don't get to join us this first time through, this will be an annually offered program. Um, and so I know we're going to learn a lot uh, together and and I think Will's focus on community is right on because uh, again and again with his deep and vast experience actually doing this with faculty, with librarians, with others, he's talked about how it's a community of practice. Um, and that's exactly how we're um, attempting to structure this program. So if you're interested and uh, you have a faculty partner you'd like to um, apply with, that would be great. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya, for sharing that. So that is that is the the sort of quick and dirty of open pet as a thing, some specific examples and some opportunities for learning more um, with the open education network or through those other ways that we've talked about. We've got about five minutes left. I'd love to answer any questions you have or, or jump into any comments. Um, I see a question here already. Thank you. If a course is based on a published textbook, is it possible to turn it into an OER course? Um, so the course itself, so, so 
the open pedagogy piece is about sort of the way you do the course. Um, there are certainly courses that engage in open pedagogy that still involve commercial resources in one way or another. Um, when we talk about open interventions, we often talk about meeting people where they are. So we've got some people who have said like, I'm required to use this textbook. My department just says that and I don't have the power to push back on that. Does that mean I just can't do open pedagogy? And the answer, of course, is no. There are plenty of opportunities. You can open up your syllabus so that students have a better sense before they join in about what they're getting into. You can work with your students to redesign assignments. So even if the textbook is has a cost and is assigned to them, the final assessment of their work is going to be open in some different ways. You can just create more open policies that give students the opportunity to uh, bring their, their full selves into the space more completely that aren't as sort of punitive in terms of late policies and that sort of things. One of the, the advantages to the challenge that Cheryl pointed out in terms of not having a concrete four line definition is there are a lot of different ways to do this. And from my perspective, if you're centering student agency, if you're being inclusive, if you're giving people the opportunity to do this work, you're doing open pedagogy, regardless of the textbook you assign. Um, so, so from a sort of practitioner standpoint, the answer to your question is absolutely. Um, and Tanya's adding, I think a really, really good point. Interesting student created openly licensed ancillaries developed in a course with a proprietary textbook. Um, I mentioned Rajiv Janyani and one of the big, sort of the first big things he made a splash with was he had students create questions for a test bank that went with potentially a proprietary uh, resource. And his idea was students learn better and demonstrate their learning better by mastering the material to the point that they can create thoughtfully designed questions and credible distractors to wrong answers that are close enough that they might persuade somebody that they're the right answer. Um, that's a nice example of one of the one of the, the big figures in this space doing exactly what your question was about. And thank you, Cheryl, for sharing that handout as well. We've probably got time for one or maybe two more questions. Is there anything else we can answer now? Yes, so an instructor with that textbook will be qualified to apply for the OEN program. Absolutely. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out and we'll answer those questions. But by and large, if you're somebody who's interested in learning about open pedagogy, and if you're committed to going back to your institution and spinning up a, a type of work in this space, this is the right program for you. So yes, that's a long way of saying yes, absolutely. Even if there's a commercial textbook, we're happy to have a conversation about how open pedagogy fits in that space.